Video Pro is called back to order. The time is 11.20. Uh, our next case is Mr. James E. Smith. Mr. Smith, uh, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? James Edward Smith, 84129. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow the participants who've indicated they have in, uh, they wish to speak to have their input. Uh, here on your behalf today is uh, Joyce Wilderson, Demaka Smith, Shawanda Nelson, and Elsie Smith. Uh, also present is Ann Cohen, Aisha Cohen, Natasha Cohen, Reginald Smith, and Willie Smith. Uh, here in opposition uh, is Mr. Roy Breland, uh, Ms. Linda Wall, and Ms. Mary Graham. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our procedure, sir? Yes, sir. This is uh, the matter of James E. Smith, DOC number 84129, date of birth, August the 31st of 1946. He's a second class, of, he's a second uh, offender, classified as a second offender. He has a parole eligibility, he has an adjusted good time date, of August the 7th of 2038, a full term date of September the 26th of 2091. He is serving uh, a 115-year sentence on the charge of attempted aggravated rape where he was uh, adjudicated a habitual offender in aggravated crime against nature. Uh, Mr. Smith, is that all accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. Mr. Roche will end his questioning of you. Would you please answer any questions he may have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Smith. How are you? Good morning, sir. Good. Mr. Smith, currently 76 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you've been convicted of two felonies. And this is a re hearing. When was your last hearing? Last hearing? Was yes. uh, the last hearing I had was in 2017, sir. I came back on uh, court. How about 2019? Yes, sir. 2019. Yes, sir. And, and you were denied because of victim opposition and law enforcement opposition, and the judge was opposed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I see why you've earned 404 days good time. Tell me about some of the program that you've completed. I think you've been incarcerated for 46 and a half years. Yes, Is sir. that correct? Yes, sir. So tell me about the program you completed. I completed a uh, victim opposition. I haven't completed it yet, but I feel the uh, cage of rage. Pre uh, 100 hours, taking over you. And uh, now I'm in process of victim opposition. I haven't completed that yet, sir. Uh, victim uh, awareness? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, have you completed all four phases of your sex offender treatment? Yes, sir, I have. Tell me exactly what you got out of sex offender treatment? I got a whole lot of that, sir. So tell me what? I know how to how far to steer away from a certain school a perimeter, sir. I know how far to steer away from there. Sir, how about the victim and how you affect the victim emotionally, mentally, and physically? Physically, I rephrase your question, sir. How, uh, what did you learn about the victim of this crime and how she was affected emotionally, mentally, and physically? 
<clears throat> Emotionally and physically? How did this crime affect the victim? Oh, it's I affect the, the victim. It's, I know it's, it's, it's sadly, it's, 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 it affected them badly, sir. I know it's a bad on my part. It affected them badly. I victimized everybody, sir. Did you threaten to kill the victim? No, sir. I victimized everybody, sir. I think if it wasn't for the car that pulled up in front of the house, and you said that your son, her son checked on her every morning, you grabbed your clothes and you ran out, you would have harmed that lady more than raped her. No, sir. Okay. Well, let's get started with the interview. Uh, you've been in September of this year, you've been incarcerated 47 years. You've been parole eligible since February 1996. 27 years. How many parole hearings have you had in 27 years? How many parole hearings have I had? Yes. Four. four. And you've been denied four times. Yes, sir. You were approximately 30 years old when you committed this crime. Is that correct? 20, 30 or 27 years, yeah, really. Well, you've been incarcerated for 47 years, and you're 76 years old. So I, I think you were about 30 years old when you committed this crime. So tell me what was going on when you were 30 years old that spirit, spirit uh, was the emphasis for you committing this crime? Stupidness. Stupidness. You weren't, you weren't young, you were 30 years old. I would say ignorance, hatred. Okay. Did drugs or alcohol play any part in this crime? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And what kind of drugs and alcohol did you use the night that you committed this crime? Alcohol, wine. Any illegal drugs? I would used to say illegal drugs, yes. And what and what and what kind of drugs did you use? Marijuana. Anything Which strong? Marijuana. Anything stronger than marijuana? I used to take frying pan stuff and slip it through my nose. Were you intoxicated the night that you committed this crime? Semi. What kind of treatment have you received? to uh, address the problem you have with drugs and alcohol? Since I've been locked up? Yes. Well, since I've been locked up, I try to deal with my own problems. What kind of programming have you taken? Living in balance, celebrate recovery, substance abuse, NAAA meetings. Have you participated? in any of those programs? Well, they told me to stay away from substance abuse because I didn't take it. I didn't see I had no drug problem when I came here. But you did have a problem. Yeah, but I didn't say that. So when, so when you entered prison, you told me that you didn't have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Nope. Consequently, you've received no rehabilitative uh, program to work on that situation. Is that correct? No, sir. 
What name, bro? Yes, sir. Would you look in his jacket to see if there's any substance abuse education or treatment? No, sir. I'm looking at his lawn. Um, he told them when he first came in here that he didn't have a substance abuse problem, so therefore they didn't give him any substance abuse treatment. Thank you, Warren. You're welcome. Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. How long did you engage in smoking of marijuana? How many years? Yes. Quite a few years, sir. So, we, so, you, so you started probably when you were a teenager, right? Yes, sir. So, and you commit this crime at third, so we talking 10, 15, 20 years. Yes, sir. Okay. How long did you sniff chemicals? A few years. Maybe 20, 10, 15 years, sir. So, so basically, you do have a substance abuse problem that's unaddressed at this time. Okay. Yes, what is your current job assignment? Do you still have a job assignment? Right now, I'm, I, I have a problem with my lower back. Just I've assigned to a kitchen, but I don't hardly do anything, sir. So, so you're on semi. Uh, just disabled to work because I have a lower back disc problem. Yes, I know. Are you are you a trustee? Yes, sir. Or Amber? Um, yeah, he's minimum B. He's supposed to work in the kitchen, but he don't. Okay. Um, Now, Mr. Smith, you've been incarcerated for almost 47 years. How are you going to support yourself if and when you're ever released? Sir, I'm able to do certain things, like do certain hobby craft. I'm able to do certain work. Like do uh, Mr. Smith, are you? for Social Security or any form like SSI? Yes, sir. You are eligible for Social Security? Yes, sir. Tell us what I see you have a transition plan with your sister in Tangible Hall in Louisiana. Tell us about that transition plan. Why, where are you going to live if and when you get released? I'm planning on going to live with my sister in Texas after I transfer to Texas. Okay. Now, the plan I have in my paperwork is a sister that lives in Tangible Hall, Louisiana. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But I want or to are you still with your sister in Texas? But I want to live with her for a while, and then I want to transfer that to Houston, Texas, too. If that's okay with y'all. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith has a low risk assessment. He has a fair institutional record. And his last disciplinary write-up was in November of 1999. From 23 years ago. Do you remember that write up, Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. What was that write up for? Disobedience. Disobedience, number five. Yes, sir. So, what happened in November of 1995 that you discovered that you needed to follow rules and regulations in the last almost 24 years? You've had no write-ups. Disobedience, 1995. But tell me why you haven't had any write-ups since then. Keeping a clean record. 
I do keep a writing record. I doing what the people tell me to do. So let me go over your programs. You probably missed a couple programs you completed. Thank you for a change. You completed all four phases of your sex offender treatment, anger management, 100 hours pre release, healthcare training, Malachi dance, and multiple faith based programs. You have opposition to your early release from the DA's office, the sheriff's office. You have five letters. Uh, five letters were sent out to the victim's families. And we got it, we received no response, but we do have uh, the victim family here this morning. And they will make their statements a little later in the presentation. Mr. Smith, I see that you recently made some hospital visits. How is your medical issues? It's in bad shape, sir. I see the last time you went to the hospital was in February of last year. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Are all your medical issues under control? No, sir. I got a perforated heart rate, sir. Okay. Are you receiving medication and treatment for that? I had to go check on that this morning, but I delayed it for a reason because I had a parade. I had to meet the board today, sir. Okay. How are you feeling today? Kind of shake it right now because I'm nervous because I had to meet the board. I had to go. Okay. Warren Ambo, do you have any comments, concerns, or remarks at this time? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Thank you, Warren Ambo. Mr. Tim? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Smith, yes, ma'am. Uh, have you been taking literacy classes? Yes, ma'am. Do you know how to read yet? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Huh? I mean, how long? How long have you been taking literacy classes? Quite some time, ma'am. Because sometimes I go up and down. Because. The scores go up and down, man. Okay. Um, are you currently enrolled in literacy classes? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, thank you. That's all. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, now we're here from your supporters. Uh, we actually have four people that wish to speak, but we only allow three to speak. So uh, y'all need to decide. Uh, whether it's uh, Ms. Joyce Wilderson, Yamaka Smith, Shawanda Nelson, or Elsie Smith. One of the four of you is not going to be able to speak. Uh, Mr. Ambo, do you have a question? I guess I'll choose. So we'll ask uh, Ms. Joyce Wilderson, if you please come. My name is Joyce Edwards. I am the sister of James L. Smith, 84129. He is the oldest of our family. <laughs> James has been in anger for over 40 plus years. He is up in age, he's sickly, and can y'all please?
sent in Yahweh to grant him parole. So he was ready to come home. So I was ready to take care of him. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilkinson. Uh, Ms. Damaka Smith. Good morning to the board. My name is Damaka Smith. I'm Damaka Smith. I'm the niece of Jane Smith. It's my privilege to stand here before you guys, so, you know, to ask the grants for him to be released. He's a good person. Yes, he can make mistakes, but we learn from our mistakes. We don't stay there with you. So it's my privilege to come up here and say, you know, you know, both the parts of the minds to have my uncle released. He's been frustrated for um, 50 years. And I'm just praying, you know, that he be released. Thank you. Ms. Shawanda Nelson. Good morning to the Lord and to family. We are not negating what has happened to this family. Our uncle has served 47 years. He has done his due diligence. He was a young man when he came in. All of us make mistakes and all of us grow from our mistakes. I believe that my uncle James Smith have learned from his mistakes. He have, since he's been incarcerated, tried to the best of his ability to do better, not only for himself, but for others as well. Again, we all make mistakes and we cannot negate to this family what has happened. And we're not trying to do that. What we are saying today is that our uncle has served over 47 years incarcerated, not being in our lives. And we understand that something happened to another family as well. And I reiterate that. We are not saying that nothing happened. What we are saying is that our uncle has grown from the time that he has been incarcerated until now. He is not that 30-year-old man. He has grown, he is 76 years old, and we are asking, we know that his time on this earth is short, that you will allow him to be with his family in the rest of his last days here on earth. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we're here from the opposition, uh, Mr. Uh, Roy Breland. Good morning. Uh, who wishes to? Uh, are you, Mr. Breland? Yes, I'm. Okay. Uh, Ms. Graham, you wish to speak? Okay, yes. this is uh, Ms. May Graham. Thank you, Ms. Graham. If you'll introduce yourself, please. Yes. Tell us what you'd like us to know. My name is May Graham, and I'm the victim's daughter. She came to live with me after this happened. So I've seen personally the suffering and the misery she went through the rest of her life until she died. She was terrified of the daughter. She was terrified of everything. It was a miserable rest of her life. I cannot describe to you how this affected her. She had seven kids. My dad died, I was five. 
she was less than a year old. He was about 14. No, nine. Yeah. She ran the bus. There was nothing. She suffered a lot. But this was the most horrible thing that could have never happened to him. And he is not truthful. He is not accountable. He threatened her life. Repeated. Where we were, she was living at the time. It's about six miles from where he lived. He walked all the way over there. He had time to think. This was planned. She was isolated. There was nobody close by. He knew that. She had been there for 20 years. It's a small community. Everybody, although I, we didn't know him, everybody knew everybody. And we lived there our whole lives. He walked that far planning this. There was nowhere else for him to go there. There was no business. There was no other homes. She was strictly isolated. He knew that. He took advantage of it. He planned it. I feel like if someone had not drove, he would have killed her. If he was just wanting to go there and insult her, he would have done that and lay up under cover of darkness. This was after daylight. What was he going to do? Stay, stay the rest of the day? There's no other thing that I could possibly think of that he was going to kill her. And she thought he was going to kill her. He repeatedly, repeatedly told the he was going to kill her. She kept asking, are you going to kill me? And he said, yes, I am. You beg him, please do not let this person go. He's 70 something years old. I'm 70 years old. I'm still working. There's a lot more life after 70. And he has been an habitual offender. This wasn't the first time. It's what my understanding. He's done this before several times that it before he goes to her house that is so isolated he knew what he was doing he doesn't even say he was drunk or make an excuse he intentionally did this and her life was totally she had a hard life she couldn't even enjoy her own age. She had to have somebody with her. She was terrible. It never went away. She served her sentence. Let him serve his sentence. Let him serve just like she had to serve. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, folks. I want to thank y'all for your time and patience. And here and yeah, I'll be short about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And to the point, this man intentionally come there to kill this woman and unspeakable act. Can you imagine the terror she went through hour in, hour out, out? Him. Um, you know, committing these unspeakable acts. She asked him, are you going to kill me? She, he says, I, you don't see my face now. So, yes. I had a nephew, her son, stayed with him quite a bit, quite, quite a bit with her. He was five years old. He would have killed him right off the bat if he would have been there. And the reason he would kill him, he couldn't hate him. He's a high-strung kid, and he would have been bouncing around all over the place in order to to commit his act and stay there hours, hours, I cannot believe that somebody would do that to an old woman. 
And this man is a bitch offender. This ain't a first time thing. I knew one of the old ladies that he tried to. He broke into her house. I mean, he wasn't invited in. He didn't just walk in. He broke into her house and tried to assault her. Luckily, she was surrounded with a lot of people. And she was uh, she managed to run out of there screaming. The poor old lady couldn't hardly walk. Why would you want a 30-year-old man want to assault a woman that is 60 to I think she was probably 70 to 80? Because I knew her not very well, but I fact of the matter, I used to carry pay rent to her or of uh, the place that we were renting. And I knew the lady. And uh, the when the when when the judge and the jury heard this story. They heard the true story, everybody, and they decided at that time this man was guilty. He is an habitual offender. So I don't think he's got, I really don't think he's got the capability of not offending again. If he's able to walk, he will offend again, and he would be here for murder if he hadn't been scared off by somebody coming and looking for a cow that morning. Just drove up. They didn't. And the mama said the last thing she seen of him and that she carried that to her grave. But him running down the road trying to put his pants on like a coward. He wouldn't stand and 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 go against anybody but a 60, 70, 80 year old woman that uh, he could control. And I just don't I can't understand how anybody like him could pass to be left out, much less. You know, that's condoning what the jury said to start with. This man is in there for 115 years. And I just don't believe I would give anybody in here want him exposed to their grandchild, their grandmother. Now that he's in bad health and older, who would be next? Would it be little kids that he can control? And that's all I really have to say. And I appreciate y'all saying yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, two of the children, my brother and my little brother, still live in Cashville Parish. They live not right in that town, but they're close in the sanity on that area still. Thank you. That's what I wanted to thank say. You. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Smith, is there anything you'd like to say before the panel votes? I ask y'all for mercy, sir. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Sam Wigley. Mr. Rochet. Mr. Smith. You're a your case is a difficult case. You're going to be 77 in September of this year. You have serious medical issues. You've been incarcerated for almost 47 years. And you have a problem. and you hadn't addressed that problem with substance abuse. Before I deliver my decision, I wanna thank the victim's family for their appearance today. I appreciate your statements, but there's three reasons for incarceration. First reason is isolation. Because that person is a risk to public safety. At the age of 77 years old, with the medical issues that Mr. Smith has, I don't think he's a danger to society. Second reason is retribution. Punishment for the crimes that is committed. 
Mr. Smith has been incarcerated for almost five decades, 47 years. And then rehabilitation. Mr. Mr. Smith has taken Thank You for a Change, Anchor Management, a host of other programs, Medicaid Dads, $100 free release. The only thing that he doesn't have is substance abuse education. And I may be wrong, but under the care of his sister, with a very tight curfew and a restriction of no contact with the victim family, I think we can solve that by him attending NAAA meetings at least two or three times a week. Having said all of that, I'm going to grant Mr. Smith's request based upon You can't be take out. Take out. Thank you. Oh, it was a Mrs. Smith, yes, I'm going to I'm going to grant your request based upon your age based upon the length of your incarceration. That is the only two reasons that I can think of for granted, because I don't think you are dangerous to be tired, and you've served almost 47 years of incarceration. Your conditions after release, you must follow all requirements of your sex offender registration. You must register as a sex offender and you are to follow all recommendations or requirements of that sex offender contract. Yes, sir. And I want you to have a curfew from 8 p.m. It's 7 a.m. Between those hours, you are not to be outside of your sister's home. Oh, yes, sir. If you come in contact with the victim's family, you are to vacate that space immediately. I don't want you having any contact. Yes, sir. Family. Yes, sir. You know, how are you, sir? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Berkshire. Mr. Jackson. All right, Mr. Smith. Um, I concur with my colleague based on your age, the fact that you've served almost 50 years in prison, the fact that you've not had any write-ups since 1999, and that you have um, participated in good programming, both like what Peter Grant with the same image. Thank you. I'd like to thank the victim's family for being just encouraged. I concur with my colleagues based upon his age and the time that he's present. Like the conditions is outlined. 
The parole has been completed, uh, Mr. Smith. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. Well, I, I think Mr. Rocher forgot to mention one part about why he would be released, and maybe it's because he's expensive right now for the prison system. Uh, that was the first time that we've ever had anyone asked to be removed from the parole hearing. That was the first time we've heard a scene being made like that and it was um i assume it was one of the women who spoke on behalf of the victim and it it just goes to show how traumatic it still is um and the pain that they're in and it wasn't the victim herself it was uh so when he spoke on behalf of the victim, the victim had passed away since. You know, it's, it's, they really only did release because I guess what Mr. O'Shea listed, he, he, he can, he's got all his medical problems. He can barely walk. If he was, uh, if he could move around, I don't think they would do it. Um, because there's something, there's something very antisocial, something very scary, something very disturbing about a young man that breaks into homes and, and does that to older women. There is something clinically wrong, even more so than in other cases, I believe. I, I tried reading up on it while I was listening to the case, but there's a lot of different theories and opinions Uh, and, and it clearly wasn't his first time, and, and yeah, he, he, he but the, the question comes down to, well, I think what it really, what it just came down, you know, thankfully the, the victim ad, ad victims did speak so we could hear the full story and, and how violent it was and how scary it was and who he, 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 scary and violent he is, but, and he really has like no insight into himself the, the, there's nothing impressive about his interview he's learned nothing he's like really done nothing like we have seen people who just make the absolute best out of their incarceration and he's on the low end of the totem pole and maybe it's an iq thing maybe it's a combination of different things But he was not likable. His his head in his hand the whole time. You know, there's any solace is he's going to be living with his sister. He he might, you know, I can't I can't see him really being able to navigate what the free world is. He has no idea what it's going to look like. Forty seven years. It's a whole different universe. Uh, but he's so sick. He's, he's not a threat to anyone. He's really not. And I think they, they really released him because of that. It's a, it's a huge financial burden for them to take care of someone who's at end of life. And, um, I think that's really the primary reason, but also the bottom line is he, he has been punished 47 years. He, uh, And he's not a threat to society. So the pain, the you know, the pain of the, the heart, it does go out to the victims. I, I, I wish I, you know, could. It's um, and it's 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 sad that they haven't been able to 
it's 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 traumatizing to hear the pain that they're going through. It's just not. It's just a terrible. It's like um, it's like you're getting victimized twice. But do you think that it should make a difference? Do you think he served long enough, and that he, because he's not a threat, that it's it's time for him to, you know, it's not even about doing it for him, but it's just, <laughs> I don't know, doing it for his family. What are your thoughts? I know that there's it's often split. There are those that say. You just got to be locked up forever, regardless as a certain form of punishment that the victim always comes first. And, and there are those that that feel, you know, that 47 years is long enough and he, he, he's no threat to anyone. He can't hurt anyone. I, I know those that will say that may have stories of people who have been in his type of physical condition that can still hurt people. And that's also possible. Um, but it's probably up to his sister to keep him out of those scenarios. And you would think that, 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 you know, unless he's put in a room next to someone who's more frail than he is, that he's not going to be able to hurt anyone. Anyways, it, it was, it was harrowing to hear is that the right word? It was traumatic to hear the, the woman screaming in the hall. And then Mr. Mirabella cracked a smile, which I just felt was highly inappropriate. I don't know what that was about. You know, with, it, it, it don't want to pass judgment without being able to actually see everything that's going on. But he did crack a smile there. And, you know, we don't even know. We don't even know who was, what was that was making the scene or what she said to get kicked out. But the pain was very real for her. With that, I'll let you, I'll let you go.